Institute of Technology. On tonight's live broadcast from here in the KTH Library, we will explore the ultimate destiny of man and robot and search for solutions to the global health gap. But first, let's dive headfirst into the field of physics. In the year the Atlas detector was completed, I happened to be visiting Geneva and was invited to see the Large Hadron Collider at CERN for myself. We put on yellow hard hats and were taken deep into the earth, into the bowels of the largest machine I am ever likely to see. The accelerator is a circle 27 kilometers round, and the Atlas detector is equal in size to half of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. But what it looks like, really, is what the insides of spaceships looks like in movies, or like a time machine. In a symbolic way, the Large Hadron Collider is a time machine. It recreates conditions just after the Big Bang, and as you know, it has enabled humanity for the first time to detect the Higgs boson. How do finds like this affect our understanding of reality, and what other miracles and wonders does the field of physics have in store for us in our lifetime? With me to discuss these questions are Raman Amanola, a postdoc in observational astrophysics and cosmology at the Oscar Klein Center at Stockholm University, Stian Hellman, professor in elementary particle physics, also at Stockholm University, and Jonas Strandberg, assistant professor, Department of Physics, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and joining us on Skype, uh, is uh, John Ellis, Professor of Theoretical Physics at King's College London and Guest Professor at CERN. There's John. Welcome to Crosstalks. Hi, how are you? I'm uh, on the line from uh, Al Ain in the United Arab Emirates. I'm very pleased and honoured to be with you. Well, warm welcome to you all. I would like the four of you to start by describing quite briefly what kind of physics you do and what you are currently researching. This may be the hardest question all evening. <laughs> Let's start over here. So um, I'm an experimental particle physicist. Um, I've, I'm a member of the ATLAS experiment. And for the last six years, I've been searching for the Higgs boson. And uh, now that we've found it, that we announced the discovery last year, my, my research is shifting towards measuring the properties of this new particle and comparing the measurements to, to the theoretical predictions we have for, for the properties that you have. Mm -hmm. Still. Well, like Jonas, I'm an experimental particle physicist. I've been working on the ATLAS experiment for over 20 years now, actually. Uh, so I, I've been taking part in the construction and design of the detector, and I've been using it to try and search for something we call supersymmetric particles. Mm -hmm. And now I'm shifting towards investigating the heaviest quark, the top quark. Very well. Already you lost me there a little bit. <laughs> but we'll see, what, we'll see where this goes. Raman. Uh, I work in observational cosmology, uh, so I try to study the expansion history of the universe, so how the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang up to today. And I do that because I want to know what is causing the expansion, what forces of nature are, that are, are doing this. And uh, what we know today is that the universe is accelerating, but we don't know why. So I try to look for observational signatures that could give us clue, a clue to why this is happening. Well, again, to the layman, this sounds very worrying. I'm happy we'll have an opportunity <laughs> to return to this so you can, you can calm us down. And John, please, uh, what's, what's your work, Professor Ellis? So I'm a theoretical physicist, and uh, the way I like to describe it is I try to think of things for the experimentalists to look for, mm -hmm. and then, of course, I hope they find something different so that we're getting some you know, new clues about the way the universe works. So uh, in the past, I've been working a lot on the Higgs boson, uh, also this theory of supersymmetry that uh, Sten mentioned, and currently I'm very much following uh, the developments at the LHC and trying to interpret them uh, in various different theories. Mm. During the time uh, that uh, you have been in physics, what for you personally has been the most exciting or astonishing breakthrough? Uh, let's start with John Ellis. Well, I, I think that uh, this discovery on July the 4th of this new particle, which I would say almost certainly is the Higgs boson, although we don't officially claim that just yet, this was certainly you know, one of the most exciting moments. Uh, personally, in the past, you know, I've had other exciting moments, like, for example, uh, back in 1979 when the gluon was discovered thanks to a su su suggestion that I made to uh, my experimental colleagues. Uh, 
Well, there have been a lot of excitement, but I think this discovery on July the 4th was really a very, very big one. Mm. Roman. Well, it's hard to pinpoint a certain moment. I mean, the last decade has been pretty amazing in itself. Um, I remember when I was a kid, and I was reading books about cosmology and space, and all the numbers were that the age of the universe is 10 to 20 billion years, and now we know it's 13.7. So I would say that, that the precision in cosmology and astrophysics during the past decade has been, whenever I've saw, seen, been seeing these numbers coming up, it's been quite amazing. Mm. Well, if, if I'm to pick a specific moment, it's something which has perhaps not so much scientific content, but it <coughs> the most exciting thing I've seen for the last decades is certainly when first we saw particles produced by the Large Hadron Collider and detected them in the Atlas detector, because that was the end of close to 20 mm -hmm. years of construction, and in that very moment we knew that we had succeeded and physics could begin. So that's... Physics could begin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yes, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's a, that's a good answer, actually, Stan. I, I agree. Then when we first saw collisions, that was a, a really a great day. Um, but for me personally, maybe in my research, it, it has to be the discovery of the Higgs boson, and this was uh, a fantastic uh, occasion, I think. We'll return to the Higgs boson a little later. I, I would, I, I'm going to ask you another typical layman question. This work that you all do, does it have any practical applications at all? Um. Not, I think it, it, it depends on what you mean with the work we do. There, there are different um, tasks we do, like programming and building the detectors, and all of that has practical applications. The, the physics theories themselves, um, the theories of the Higgs boson and the other very unstable particles, that's, we don't know of any practical applications for those yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. John Ellis. Well, I, I would agree with uh, what you just said. On the other hand, we do know that in the past, every time we've made some fundamental breakthrough in understanding physics, it's turned out to be useful for something. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, when was it, uh, 80 years ago, the idea of antimatter was proposed. And now antimatter seemed very, at the time, a very abstract theoretical concept. But uh, in the meantime, it's become used in medical diagnosis. Uh, so that's one example of how a fundamental breakthrough in uh, physics can have unexpected applications. So, no, who knows? Maybe the Higgs boson will turn out to have unexpected applications. It's certainly very interesting for cosmology. Mm. Uh, Raman, I, you mentioned billions of years. The work that you do is on a time scale that isn't... I'm talking about things like the end of the universe and things like that. That's not super relevant to humans, of course, because evolutionary time scales are so much smaller. We're not going to be around. We can be pretty certain about that. No, it, it, it's true, but, but um, I mean, the reason why I find it very interesting is because on these large timescales, we're really probing fundamental physics, or physics at the most fundamental level, the laws of nature. Um, and that is something that, that is very relevant to us as human beings, I think. Mm -hmm. So even if the timescales themselves are not relevant, what we learn from it is very relevant. Would I be correct in saying that quantum physics, which the three of you uh, do, and astrophysics, which is Raman's field, operate on different models of how the universe works, and that these models don't entirely add up? Mm, I, I would say that we operate at different ends of the spectrum, and there are certain unknowns in how to tie these parts together. Uh, that's how I would phrase it. But, I mean, there are also certain areas where we certainly do connect. I mean, yeah. you can deduce things about how many species of neutrinos there are from the way the universe has its structure. So I think it's surprisingly really how well they do connect. I mean, the very, very first moments after the Big Bang, you need to apply our theories to the universe to understand how it develops. So there are connections which yeah. have been strengthened, I'd say, in the last decade or two, as our understanding has. That's true, and when we let the universe propagate for, for tens of billions of years, what we observe today in terms of how much hydrogen, how much helium there is in relevance, it, it, it agrees completely with what we predict to happen, to be produced in the early universe. Uh. Then I would like to ask you this question, um, this rather vast question, really. What is the ultimate goal of your field? What are you all striving for? 
the, I mean, the official answer is to, to search for the smallest constituents of matter and the, the forces that act between them, so how things move and, and so how the universe works and operates, what it consists of, how it's going to evolve and um, how it started. Uh, I guess that's the goal, and I think uh, we won't reach that goal in, in our lifetime, or, or maybe ever, so it's a, it's a long-term goal. Do, would you guys agree, Stan? Yeah, I mean, I, I th but I think you could formulate it a bit differently. I think what the ultimate goal must to be, be to have a theory which is completely internally consistent and which describes everything that we can observe. And on both of these fronts, we have problems today because the, the theory has some, not perhaps inconsistencies, but it's very peculiar and it doesn't feel very natural. And there are phenomena that we can't describe with the current theory, so, so that's why we need to push ahead. What kind of phenomena? Well, I, I, if you want to be... Uh, the, the obvious one is dark matter. We know that, that there's five times as much matter out there as, as the type that builds up you and me and, and this library, mm -hmm. but we don't know, have a clue what its constitutes, mm -hmm. constituents are and what makes it up, and, and we're trying to find out. What would you say, journalists? will we... Uh, is it possible to reach this goal in our in our lifetimes? I guess that depends on what we how we what we project for our lifetimes to be. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say in the next couple of decades. Well, I, I think that we're we're poised to make some real big breakthroughs. Uh, I don't think we're going to answer all the most uh, fundamental questions. I, I think where did this discovery of the Higgs boson it could, for example. Uh, have some connection with the problem of uh, the accelerating expansion of the universe that was mentioned earlier on. Uh, the idea of supersymmetry, which was mentioned by Sten, which is also something I find very interesting, this could, be, this could resolve the problem of dark matter that uh, has also been mentioned. So I think there's many you know, fundamental problems in the way the universe works that the LHC could help provide us some answers to. And of course, in parallel, their searches uh, using astrophysics and cosmology, uh, for example, their experiments looking directly for dark matter, and I think it's going to be crucial to connect what those experiments do with what the LHC discovers. So really, if we, there's a number of riddles that are being worked on at, at, at the same time, and solving any of those could, could have a sort of trigger effect and solve mm. other problems along the, along the whole chain. Yes, absolutely. It must be very exciting to go to work in the mornings. Not always. <laughs> so, you know, everything becomes uh, uh, your everyday life. So uh, now, I mean, sometimes it is. When, when we make big uh, breakthroughs in understanding and when we further our knowledge about the universe, that's very exciting. Um, and also, for us experimentalists, the, the puzzle of, of understanding our data coming out of the LHC, I think, is very exciting. It's uh, a little bit like detective work. We're, we're looking for a new particle, maybe the Higgs boson, and we have to... Uh, convince ourselves whether it's there or not. So this is a, like a detective game. You, you look at your data, you see if you see the things you expect to see, if the, if the Higgs boson existed, and then at some point you have to determine whether you're sure it exists or not. So these, these things I find exciting. Yeah. We're going to have to talk a little bit about the Higgs boson, I feel. I've, mm -hmm. I've done some reading, and this is... I'm just going to run my, my amateur understanding by you. It sounds like this. The Higgs field is, we think, what gives particles mass, its existence had previously been conjecture and conjectured, and now this Higgs particle, which is produced in the Higgs field, has been observed. And this would seem to prove that the Higgs mechanism is real, that that, that, that is how particles uh, gain matter, uh, ma mass. Sorry. But now I, I get a little worried that John Ellis just said, almost certainly we have found <laughs> the Higgs boson. So let's just start there. Have, we or have, we, have you or have you not observed the Higgs boson? John. Well, I, I actually think that's a question for, uh, for our experimental friends to answer. So th there are a, a bunch of properties that this particle should have if it's the Higgs boson. So uh, one of the key properties is, uh, does it connect to other particles proportional to their mass? Since it's responsible for particle masses, as you said, then its connections with other particles should reflect those masses. And there's some indications that that's consistent with the data, but no, that could be improved. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another absolutely key property is how the particle spins. All the elementary particles that we've ever come across spin around on their axes. Photons, the particles of light do, that's responsible for the polarization of light. 
The electron spins around. All particles spin around. But it is absolutely key that this Higgs boson should not spin. And that's one of the key things that we're looking for now in the data to see whether we can verify that prediction. And, and also I would say that, I mean, it's a little bit personal how you interpret the discovery, but we, we could say that we found the Higgs boson. What we don't know is that if every theoretical prediction we have of this new particle is true, and that takes time to verify experimentally. There are many things we have that we have predicted for this particle. For example, this spinning of the particle that we still need to verify in data. So we found the particle and everything points to it being the Higgs boson. I, I think we can say it's the Higgs boson, but we're not sure yet whether everything is as we predicted it to be. I'm going to have to ask here what being sure means, because before the, the, the Large Hadron Collider was started, I asked a, a man who was working at CERN whether you guys are absolutely sure that you're not going to you know, make the world explode or something like that by pressing the button. And he said, well, <laughs> of course we're not sure, he said. And I got very worried. And, and then he said, but from your perspective, from, from, he said something along the lines of, I don't think you're, expe you're equipped to understand <laughs> <laughs> what not being sure means. He said, when I say I'm not sure, what, what it means in your language is you, we are absolutely sure. So is this the kind of normal human, normal average person not sure about the Higgs boson, or is it a sort of scientific not sure about the Higgs boson? Well, more of could a, I just yeah. jump yes, in for a second? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so this business about uh, blowing up the planet, mm -hmm. I am, always have been, absolutely sure <laughs> that the LHC would not blow up the planet. And I give you a very simple reason for that, which is that higher energy collisions have been occurring since the beginning of the universe, uh, on Earth, elsewhere, with cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere, and, and so on. And if anything dangerous was going to be produced by the LHC, it would have been produced by those cosmic ray collisions. We're still here. We're still discussing the subject. <laughs> that means that there's nothing to worry about. That's N -O -T -H -I -N -G. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Very well. I will accept this. And it's a much more comforting answer. I wish that's the one he would have given me to begin with. Um, but, but how, again, how sure, how sure are we about... Would it, would it be in lay terms, are we sure that it's the Higgs boson? I'm just going to press you on this. Come on. I'm, yeah. We're not going to release a press release saying, now, now you said it. But <laughs> we, we are not sure of, of um, the properties of this particle just yet. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there we have indication that it agrees with what we have predicted. Uh, we are sure that the particle exists. The, the probability of this being a fluctuation is, uh, is less than one in a hundred millions or something like this. So th this we can ignore. But... But the properties and needs more data and more time to study properly, mm. and there we're not sure. Stan, what does it mean that we probably know now about um, the Higgs boson? Well, I mean, th this is part of, of, of this general and rather old discussion on what, what does it mean to prove something. And if you go back to Popper, for instance, you can't prove anything. You can just <laughs> disprove things. And yeah. essentially, that's what we try to do. We try to disprove a world without the Higgs boson, and we fail. And often, when we fail hard enough, we say that we have discovered the Higgs boson. I mean, that's the way it goes. And, and we try to quantify this in probabilities for this being a mistake and give numbers like 10 to the mm -hmm. minus 9. I mean, that means one in a billion that this is a fluke. But when you reach this type of, of probabilities, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, in any practical sense of the word, it means that we are sure that it's there. We just and if we are sure, that means now we're we can move on to the next step of chain of proof that we're trying to achieve here. So what would that be? Right. John Ellis. Yeah, so, so uh, as Stan said, we are absolutely sure that this thing exists. <laughs> what we're not quite sure yet about is whether it has the right properties, as has already been mentioned. So, for example, the idea that it has the wrong spin, you know, that's you know, disfavored at the 91% level. Uh, as Sten said, in some sense, you can never prove anything. You can only disprove things. Mm -hmm. So the hypothesis that it has been too is currently disfavored, not disproved, at the 91% confidence level. Uh, then there are other properties of the particle that have been disfavored, not disproved, but disfavored at the level of 97%. So you know, we want to push all those up until we get to, I know, 99%, 99.9%. Mm -hmm. At that point, we'll say, OK, well, this is not an interesting question anymore. And then you can move on to the next yeah. thing. So again, what would the next thing be? 
Or am I ahead of myself? Is this going to be like 15 years from now you can move on to the next particle or the next problem? Or? Yeah, we're absolutely not done with the Higgs boson. Uh, these kind of studies of the properties of the Higgs boson can either yield uh, an answer that everything is uh, according to, to predictions, but more interesting, this, of course, is if we find some of these properties deviating from what we have predicted, which means that maybe some new particle that we haven't discovered yet comes in and, and interacts with the Higgs boson and changes uh, these properties. So it, it, I think the first step is definitely to continue these studies of these new particles. We're not done uh, with that mm -hmm. by any means. We've just started. Okay, let me, let me rephrase the question again. Has this find taken humanity closer to establishing a unified theory of everything? Yes. Yes, <laughs> unequivocally yes, from, from yeah, the Arab Emirates. Uh, Stan? Yes, but it could have been even better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I if it had been something like the Higgs boson, but it behaved in a way very different from what we had been expecting in our current framework, we would have a clue how to proceed. Because what we try to do now is to, to break this framework. We want to show that this model that we have is somehow not the, the ultimate model. This is the standard to, model of... Yes, we call it the standard the model standard of particle model. physics. You've helpfully named it. <laughs> that. Yes. With and capital S and capital well, yeah. Yeah, So if I, could, if I could add to that, mm. I, I think there's a, a couple of things to watch out for. So, so, so there is one property of this particle that maybe deviates a little bit from the standard <laughs> model prediction. Mm? Uh, and uh, maybe this is getting a bit technical, but this is you know, something to listen out for. So, so one of the key ways to look for this particle is decaying into pairs of photons, the particles of light. And this is quite a subtle process, and it depends, as has been said, on the properties of possibly additional particles beyond the standard model. And currently, the indications are that maybe this decays a little bit more than would have been expected in the standard model. So one of the things that we you know on tenterhooks to learn is whether the experiments find there's a real discrepancy there or not. And we may learn something about that next week when the next round of data is released. So, so that's one thing that we're watching out for. Then there's another thing which uh, is probably going to uh, worry you even more. <laughs> is what exactly is the, the mass of this particle? And upon that question, the answer to that question depends the future of the universe. If the mass is sufficiently low, then in the standard model, our universe is unstable, and eventually it's going to decay. So you might think that's bad news. I think that's very, very, very good news. Why because would that it means be? Because that there has to be some other new physics to make our universe stable, and we're going to go and chase it down. Okay, <laughs> I'm turning to you, Raman, because um, it sounds to me as though we're now sort of slipping into your area. <laughs> if, if the universe is unstable, is, is this, when you're talking about the universe accelerating and so on, is that the same thing as, when you're, when you're looking at projections of how the universe will end, is that the same kind of, of thing that what we're talking about here when we're saying the universe is unstable and will uh, dissolve? <clears throat> Not quite. But it's, it's uh, connected and it could help because um, just like these guys, we also have problems with explaining exactly why things are the way they are. And, and because they have to be the way they are in order for us to sit here and actually measure it. So it's a strange problem. And, and uh, um, these things which, which, which are thought of that you can, this, this Higgs boson will fall down to, to a lower vacuum or whatever, mm -hmm. it's, it's unstable and produce something new. That could, could very well be the sort of explanation people are looking for to also explain why the value of the, the, why the acceleration is the way it is, that you have many different values out there, many different universes out there, if you wish, and we happen to live one in, in one of them. So that, that's something that, that, that's being debated uh, within the field. For many people, many people are arguing that this is the way to get around the problem. Others are saying that maybe this is not quite the way we should look at it from a physics point of view. Uh, other universes, that mean, does that mean sort of other dimensions? I'm, I'm trying to uh, grasp what it, that it means. It means really other universes. I mean, I, I'm doing observations, so I tell people, listen, I want to 
stay with both my feet on the ground and look out there and see what's out there. So if you tell me there's other universes out there, tell me something that I can measure that proves this. This is mm -hmm. my point of view from, from this. Uh, and so far, nobody has given me that. Uh, so for me personally, I think this is very interesting. This might be, be a, an explanation, but it's not really scientifically that interesting until we have some kind of signature to look for. Mm. Your work uh, is built on measuring light from supernovae, and uh, this is related to the hunt for something called dark energy. Why are we looking for that? And possibly also, what is that exactly? So by observing the supernovae, what people did some, some uh, 14 years ago, and they were also rewarded by the Nobel Prize in Physics 2011 for this discovery, they discovered that the expansion of the universe is going faster and faster and faster. And the only force that we know that acts on the universe on these large scales, on the dynamics of the universe, is gravity. Mm. And gravity is an attractive force. And this is why Earth revolves around the sun and so on. Uh, they don't push each other apart. So if you have a force in the universe that affects the dynamics at these scales and is repulsive, that's quite a discovery. That's something new, that's something unheard of. Um, and since um, they didn't know what it is, so since we do not know what it is, we call it dark energy in terms of, of, of something um, unknown. So what we hope to do with this supernovae, we continue to do this and we continue to measure the expansion rate. And what we hope to do is, okay, we don't know what it is, but let's look for some observational signature that will tell us something about the properties of the acceleration. Because by doing that, we can test different theories or different ideas that could possibly explain this. Um, so we're really grasping in the dark uh, here, trying to look for anything, that, anything new that could give us any clue on what this phenomenon really is. And that's why it's called dark energy. It's just a name for nothing. We don't know what it is. Dark as yeah. an unknown. I think, I think the fact that it's called energy, right, is that um, the idea is that all of space has some constant energy density. So that if you take a volume, it has a certain energy associated with just the empty space there. And if you double that volume, you double the energy. So by expanding the universe, you're creating more and more energy. And this is what, what creates the outward force. That This is what's driving the expansion, that you're, you're increasing your energy as you just increase the size of the space. And that's why we call it dark energy, because it is some kind of energy which is, is everywhere in space, even in empty space. So that's one explanation. Another explanation could be that gravity, as we know it, is wrong. We have the wrong theory for yeah, gravity. Sure. So that could be another way. So maybe gravity is weaker on large scales, and that's why it looks like these things are accelerating. That would be so they're, they're, a typical example of, of the theories not being quite consistent. Of the things that we know, not maybe perhaps being quite consistent. Might not be the full answer. I think all of us are pretty sure that what we know today is not the full answer. So, so what would happen? I mean, if the goal is to figure out everything, what would happen if you do? Well, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that uh, you know, always when you you answer some question, then this raises new questions, and I think it's I personally I believe it's an endless quest. So, for example, take this new particle. Let's assume it's the Higgs boson. Then it raises all sorts of other questions, like uh, why does the Higgs boson have the mass that it does? Uh, why is our universe apparently not uh, decaying? Uh, there's many other issues that uh, we're going to be exploring. So uh, this is not something that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> You're not going to run out of work anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> no. the daughter, uh, perhaps, I, I, yeah. perhaps I could just comment a little mm -hmm. bit about this dark energy thing. Yes. So the, the principle of dark energy actually was pointed out by Einstein very soon after he came up with the theory of general relativity. He pointed out there was this thing that he called the cosmological constant that, that could be there in his equations. And uh, well, I think initially he wasn't so sure this was such a good thing. Uh, but now uh, astrophysicists and cosmologists like Raman here, they're telling us, well, you know, you have to take this thing seriously. Uh, and to come back to our friend the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson actually contributes to this dark energy. So you might say, well, that's good news, well, except it's not, actually, <laughs> because actually the Higgs boson would contribute way too much uh, amount to this dark energy. So actually there's a big puzzle here in why is there dark energy? Not only that, but why is the amount of dark energy as small as it apparently is? So this is something that, you know, we particle physicists and cosmologists like Raman will be you know, 
discussing backwards and forwards, I think, for quite a long time to come. And would it, is the idea of other universities, would that be a part, is it that a cop-out saying, some of it goes away somewhere else? Is it? <laughs> yeah. That's my, I mean, that's my opinion on this. I think it's That's your actual a, scientific opinion. No, <laughs> my personal <laughs> opinion is that these explanations of, of different universes is, 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 is not very fruitful uh, explanation, right? Like the Ramon said, it's nothing we can test right now. So even if it was true, it's, it, it seems like a bit of a escaping the, the question, I think. Well, you, you could reach a point where you have a, a theory which predicts multiple universes, which also predicts some very basic things about our universe. Right. which you can't reproduce in other theories. Then, then, you, then, you, could, yeah. then so you have a useful theory. So yeah. what you, your work really would be to exclude every other model so that you're sure that it's not just laziness. And then if the, yeah. if the energy still or it, it somewhere goes somewhere, if there's still too little dark energy, then you can say, okay, we're going to have to start looking for some really exotic explanations. Uh, well, I think there's a, a couple of epistemological points here. Uh, one that Sten has already mentioned. Now, you can never prove a theory. All you can do is disprove a theory. Oops. Mm. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just, no, so actually what we're yeah. trying to do now mm. uh, as an observational, doing observations, is that we're trying to disprove this idea of Einstein's cosmological constant. Because mm. the most natural answer we have is that it is Einstein's cosmological constant. And we know very well how, we should, how the universe will propagate, how the expansion will propagate. And now we're trying to look for clues that would point in a different direction. What, what you said before, though, is that you would, ask, that you would wish for the results to be wrong. You would wish for it to not be the Higgs boson at all, so that, so, that the, so that the model can break. That seems counterintuitive to me. Why wouldn't you want to prove, why wouldn't you want to know, to already have the answer? Be because that's a dream, I think, of every scientist to, to discover something which is entirely new and takes you a step beyond what you already know. Uh, and the, the best way of doing that is to disprove <coughs> this model, which is so glorious. It describes so many experimental results in such a precise way. So there must be something to it. But, but just breaking that one and proving that, that there is something more to find in some other direction, that's a wet dream of a physicist. Dream. So the better the model, the more proof there seems to be about the correctness of the model, the more glorious it is to break it. I mean, yeah, mm. to find something <laughs> truly unexpected is... is Exciting. So this is, I think, the, the, the basis of this uh, wish that we want to find something which is completely, truly uh, unexpected and which is, takes us in new directions. Yeah, I think that's what happens each time you compile these lists asking physicists, what would you like to discover most of all at the LHC, for instance? And you get all these answers back. And I think on top of all of them is something completely unexpected. That's right. what we all want to do. Um, I'm going to ask you now to move out of your comfort zones, which is stuff that you know, and ask you these questions. If we can figure out the rules that control reality and the universe and everything, would we then be able to hack them, to manipulate them in different ways? Or are we by necessity stuck inside well, the laws of, of the universe? Well, I mean, in a way, we... Uh, maybe not hacking, but we are hacking the universe as we go. As we discover new physics and new science, we are putting that into use. I mean, the things that we discovered in physics, pretty fundamental physical phenomena like electricity, turns out to be pretty useful. Uh, the loss of, of quantum physics, and, and we have nuclear power plants today, which is, is pure physics. So in a way, when we discover new physics, sure, we can't really change the law of physics. Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever can do that. But we certainly use what we learn, and we put it into very useful applications. And that is, in a way, reverse engineering nature and putting that into use. Stan? I, 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 I kind of agree with Raman, but I think there's an additional dimension here because we have something in complex systems which sort of seems to run against the laws of nature. I mean, we, we shouldn't be here, really. We, we don't fulfill the second law of thermodynamics as a unit. I mean, you have to look at the very... Humans don't. Yes. I mean, the natural thing would be just for us to decay into our components. But we don't. I mean, we carry on and we even grow a bit taller each day. So, so when you come to complex systems, complex systems can do things that are very, very difficult, not to say impossible, to describe with these very fundamental laws because it's just too complex for our understanding and our apparatus. And I think 
if the more we learn about the fundamental laws and rules, the more we can manipulate and understand these complex levels, which is where our daily action... Really so hypothetically, is. time travel, walking through walls, why not? Well, I, could, uh, I don't believe in time travel, mm. but maybe we can believe we're walking through walls or make walls that we think we can walk through and stuff like that. Mm. Mm. Jonas, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with the previous answers, but uh, I, I think it's hard to hack the laws of physics, but I also think that the laws of physics are what we observe, um, how, how everything works, right? I mean, we, we, we don't decide what laws of physics are, we just observe how it works. And even things like humans, complex systems, they exist, there must be some laws of nature that makes them happen, right? And, and we haven't discovered those laws yet, and so they're definitely things to, for us to discover still, but uh, I don't think we can hack them. We, we, have, we live in the universe we do, but we don't know, I mean, a lot about it, actually. I mean, we know how, how very basic particles interact, but there's so much more to learn, and, and there are even laws of physics we might not even know about yet. I don't know why it's, it's only comforting that you don't even know how, how we work. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah. The work with the Large Hadron Collider uh, involves 10,000 physicists from 85 countries. This is truly inspirational, but it also sounds very expensive. Do the gigantic investments in things like the Atlas Detector make sense for those societies that fund them? You would say yes, probably, but I, I would like to it's hear your... It's a bargain. <laughs> it's a bargain. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I was expecting that question, because mm. that's the question we always get. So, so I prepared and mm. checked what one of these new aircrafts that all the airline companies are starting to buy all over the world today cost. Uh, and the fact is that if you look at the cost of the LHC, it's about 25 or 30 of these aircrafts. But all of, the, all of it? Yes. But you can't it's fly to Bahamas with LHC. It's 26 Dreamliners or something mm -hmm. like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. A Dreamliner has a list price of around 200 million US dollars. And the price of the Large Hadron Collider is 5 billion US dollars. We'll put it that way. It is a bargain. It is. It is a bargain. We, we're using it for 25 years. It's about one aircraft a year, which we collectively pay. And, to, to yeah. and, even and a lot of countries yeah. are involved in the funding. Yes. Yeah. And even economically, it, it pays off. I mean, the spin-offs and the, the industry contracts that we, we put out to, to build the detectors, all of this generates much, much more money than, than you put in. I mean, even in the truly economical sense, I think it's one of the best investments we make. Um, and then we have the whole uh, human part of it, that we, we want to learn the answers that come out. So I think it's hard to spend the money much better, actually. But do the, these finds affect reality? I mean, obviously, no, you see, we observe reality, of course, mm -hmm. but do, uh, do you feel that you are also actively changing how humanity is, is viewing the universe? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. Yes. And, and the interest in, this, in the answer to the questions we, we're providing now is, is mm -hmm. a testament to that, I think, that people are interested in, in about knowing about how the universe works and... Uh, and I think that's, that's also what makes us human, right? We have this curiosity about understanding the, the surroundings. I think we have John Ellis back now, or at least the voice of John Ellis. John, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Unfortunately, I can't see you. I don't know what happened. Maybe a, a camel trod on the Ethernet cable or something. <laughs> well, we're very happy to, to have, you, have you back. I, I, I'd ask you sort of the same question. The, the results uh, of, of this, this uh, field, these exciting results, uh, do seem to change the way uh, the physicists, that physicists view the universe. Is it important to communicate these results to the general public? And if so, I, why? I don't think it's uh, only important. I think it's actually an obligation, uh, as indeed has just been discussed. Uh, the European taxpayer, also taxpayers elsewhere, but mainly European taxpayers, have uh, been spending a lot of money on this, and, uh, you know, they should be able to get to ride on our scientific dreamliner. <laughs> uh, so, so certainly I believe that it's incredibly important for us to, to share with people what we're doing, uh, try to contribute some of the excitement. Maybe that will inspire some uh, young kids, school kids, students to uh, take up a career in science and technology. Uh, but just also to, if you like, broaden the cultural horizons of the general public. Uh, you know, so that we all understand more about the universe and how it got to be the way it is. 
I guess you all find these theories and these models quite beautiful. Yeah. There well, are some. I mean, yeah, th there some. are some parts which you think, uh, and that's what drives you forward. Uh, I mean, the Higgs mechanism is beautiful. It saves our theory, but it's also very strange. It's n nothing you would cook up if you started from scratch. So, <laughs> so yes and no. John, I wish you could see the, the beautiful <laughs> smiles on these gentlemen's faces right now. Uh, do, do, you find, yeah. uh, do you find physics beautiful? Uh, yeah, I, I think physics is very beautiful. And uh, I think one of the most beautiful things about it is this, these connections that it gives you between the very large and the very small. I mean, here we are, a bunch of particle physicists sitting around discussing with a cosmologist. And, you know, there's all these connections between what we're doing. We're talking about the same things. Uh, dark matter, supersymmetry, dark energy, cosmological constant, the Higgs boson. Uh, and this, for me, is really beautiful, this sort of connection between the very large physics and, and the very small physics. Mm. Now, I, I should say that I, I'm not sure that beauty is a good criterion for what is a good physical theory. This is a, a point which is often debated amongst physicists. I, I, I'm actually not sure whether the standard model in itself looks particularly beautiful. Uh, you could write it on the T-shirt. I had it on the T-shirt, which you saw maybe earlier on in the program. <laughs> but I don't know that it really looks very beautiful. Mm. But, it, but it certainly works very well. And that, in a sense, is a thing of beauty. That is a thing of beauty. We are ready, I think, for some audience questions. Uh, while an audience member uh, takes a, a place to in, in the question booth over there, I'm just going to ask you guys very briefly, since our audience and, and a lot of our viewers are students, I think many of them might be curious about going into this field, and some of them, I'm sure, may feel intimidated by the abstraction level of these ideas. Does understanding theoretical physics, for instance, require a special kind of mind, or do you just pick it up in grad school? Stan? Well, I, I, you don't need to be Einstein to do particle physics, mm. but, but you need to be intrigued and interested by these things, because as any other specialization, it takes hard work and dedication to, to make progress, but if, if you've got that and if you're interested, then there's no barrier, really, to mm. anyone who's talented enough. What about cosmology? No, I mean, I, I agree with Stan completely. It's, it's, uh, the thing is that you have to go to work every day and mm. beat your head against the wall, so you, you better be dedicated. But, you know, <laughs> at some point you might actually, actually break through the wall. So. And it might be more exciting than some other kinds of frustrating jobs that are out there. Yeah, but yes. it's probably more similar to normal job than you would imagine. I think it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not so different. <laughs> Do we have uh, yeah. any audience questions? There we go. Please step up to the microphone, or bravely. I, I, I was closest. So <laughs> yes, so you win. Shoot. Uh, this one is for uh, Ramon, uh, uh, but anyone is <laughs> uh, welcome to answer. It, it's about an idea that I read about, uh, about the expansion rate of the universe. And uh, unfortunately, I don't remember the person who suggested it, but I found it interesting, and I haven't heard it addressed yet. So here it is. Uh, uh, when, when we um, uh, determine the expansion rate of the universe, we look at uh, distant galaxies, and the more distant they are, the faster they travel away from us, right? Uh, and the idea suggests that since they are distant, they are also from a younger universe when the universe was denser and also uh, uh, the time in that universe was moving slower than it does in our present universe. And uh, uh, the idea suggests that the reason why we uh, um, experience that the universe is accelerating in its expansion is because of the time dilation between our present day universe and the ancient universe. So, so I think a, a few things are, are mixed up here and that's the fact that distant galaxies are moving away from us. Um, that's true in some sense that they are, they are moving away from us but, but I think the time dilation effect you are talking about comes from something comes from bodies moving in, in a defined space. Mm -hmm. What happens with expansion of the universe is that it's space itself that expands. So um, 
the fact that the galaxy is moving away from you is an effect from the fact that there's more space created between us. So at each point, each point in space, uh, each rest point frame in space is basically sitting still, and then space itself is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no real time dilation effect in that sense. So what you see, you watch a photon, a light particle, being emitted in its rest frame, and as it travels through time and space, space is increasing. And that gives the, the effect of the, the um, um, expansion of the universe. So in fact, you couldn't have that, that effect you're talking about because the most distant galaxies that we are observing, they're actually moving faster than light, which is something that, we, that can happen according to the, the laws of physics as we understand today, if they were moving in the same confined space, if they were moving in this room. So you can't think of us moving apart. You have to think of this entire room growing and becoming bigger and bigger. And as an effect of that, the distance between us will increase. Yeah, but, but, but that, is the, uh, that is, is the expansion itself. What, what, what the question was about was the, the acceler uh, accelerating rate of expansion. Because that, that, that is the big question, isn't it? Right, uh, but, but, but the time dilation effect you're mentioning, if I understand correctly, will come from this, this velocity, this, this movement. Am I right? Uh, and, and my point is that that effect doesn't exist in, in an expanding universe. Um, it, it, I mean, there are small movements, but that's not the main, main effect that gives us the, 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 the expansion effect. So, so that cannot explain the, the acceleration. But you're perhaps very willing... I could, perhaps I could uh, jump in at this point? Yes. Yeah. John, please. So there's been a lot of uh, measurements of, uh, for example, atomic processes in uh, distant galaxies, different, distant stars, way back towards the beginning of the universe, which indicate that exactly the same laws of physics apply you know, way back early in the universe. And, and there's no hint, I think, of anything funny happening with time. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. But you're very welcome to disprove this. That would be very epic. <laughs> uh, that would be an epic response. Do, right. do, uh, yes. Uh, John? Uh, no, I, I, I was just uh, agreeing with you that uh, I, I think one of the most th important things in science in general is to always question anything or assumptions. Uh, certainly don't take seriously anything that some older physicist tells you. But uh, think things through for yourself and always look for something new. And it, indeed, you, know, you should be looking to see whether maybe relativity is wrong, uh, whether thick particles can travel faster than the speed of light. Uh, you know, of course, you know, when you bang your head against these brick walls, most of the time you bang your head and you don't knock down the brick wall. But at some point, you will break through the brick wall. Um, do we have another very brief question from, from the room? Uh, yes, uh, the lady right there. Go right ahead. I forgot to ask before, but you could maybe state just your name very briefly and, and where you're from. Oh, your uh, Elmira from the Karolinski Institute. So I'm a very, very layman. But I'm guessing we're doing basically the same thing within medicine because we are looking for biomarkers to understand mechanisms. And one of the things we uh, often meet that changes our paradigm is when new technologies come. Often it's not a hypothesis that changes, but technologies that allow us to observe something different. And I wonder if it's the same for you, if it's technology that is driving your ability to view unexpected things and what you wish were existed out there, what you're looking forward to. What a great question. Is, is that the case? Stan? In some sense, certainly, because uh, w what we do when we collide particles is that we run Einstein's equation backwards. We convert energy into mass. And we try to find things now which we believe are rather heavy. The, the undiscovered particles we hope to discover are heavy, probably. So we need more energy. And that's why we keep building bigger and bigger accelerators to get more and more energy into these collisions. So we, with the collider at lower energy, we could not have produced the top quark, for instance, because it, it was, the technology was not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the detection technologies are also very important because we are looking for phenomena which are very, very rare. So we need to have the, the technological capacity to sift through an enormous amount of data. And that's also technology driven. So certainly, I think the answer is yes. Thank you. Ron. I have a very quick mm -hmm. reply to that as well. 
The discovery of the acceleration of the universe is a direct effect of uh, technology. Uh, From C particle physics. CCD <laughs> cameras, uh, if they did not exist, we could not take the observations we needed. That was not possible. Without the CCD cameras that you all have in phones and cameras these days. That was direct. And as Stan mentioned, it's <laughs> it has a connection here again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I, I, we're, we're running out of time, as ever. <laughs> but in closing, very, very briefly, I would ask the four of you, in your respective fields, in your respective specialties, what's the next challenge? What's just, just the next big hurdle, and when will it be overcome? In a few words, you want us? Um, that's a hard question. Uh, me personally, maybe when we, when we really map out the properties of the Higgs boson, but of course I'm hoping for something truly unexpected and that we can diverge into that, uh, that area. Mm -hmm. Stan? Well, it would be discovering a particle which is not inside today's standard model, and that will happen soon after 2015 when we restart the LHC. <laughs> soon after 2015. That's yeah. a pretty, pretty solid promise there. Raman? I, I would agree with Stian, and again, connecting this, this new particle might very well be the explanation for the dark matter problem that we have in the universe as a whole. So I think uh, resolving dark matter problem would be the next big thing. And that would be a game changer as well. Yeah. John Ellis? Yeah, I, I'm going to vote for dark matter as well. I think this okay. would uh, resolve really fundamental problem in astrophysics and cosmology, and it would certainly require some sort of new particle. So as soon as this show is over, I'm going to get back to writing my <laughs> next paper on dark matter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Raman Amanola, Sten Hellman, Jonas Strandberg, and John Ellis uh, for participating in this talk. And thank you to the audience for your questions. Our guests will now move backstage to chat with you online. The next session will explore the ultimate destiny of a man and robot, and it will start on the hour. We'll be right back. Thank you.